Assalamu alaikum. I'm Irfan Hussain and I'm here with another video regarding our course of comparative literature. Today we will go through the second part of our topic of the history of comparative literature. In our previous lecture or discussion, we discussed about the works that have been done in the context of compare, comparison or comparative literature in the 19th century. Today we will dis discuss a few works of the 20th century, but, but before going to 20th century, I will talk about a couple of works that were done in 19th century and that we missed in the first video. Uh, comparative literature presumably acqui acquired its name from a series of French anthologies for the teaching of literature, published in 1816. They were entitled Co de Literature Compohe. So this was the first anthology that was published with the name of Comparative Literature and it was published in France in 1816. And the name Comparative Literature has been derived from this anthology. Then we know Matthew Arnold he mentioned the word comparative literatures, term comparative literatures, he mentioned it in plural form. In 1848, Matthew Arnold used this term comparative literatures for the first time in English. He defines everywhere there is connection, everywhere there is illustration, no single event, no single literature is adequately comprehended except in relation to other events, to other literatures. He is of the view that every piece of literature has a connection with some other piece, piece of literature or all the pieces of literature have some kind of connection with one another. And if we want to understand one piece of literature, we have to trace its connection with others because none can be understood or comprehended individually or uh, keeping it apart from other pieces of literature. So every piece of literature can be understood with connection to the other pieces of literature. That was uh, the view of Matthew Arnold. Then there was general version of the term and uh, that was uh, Portuguese literature, Gesetio, uh, something like that. That is not actually German pronunciation. And it was first appeared in book of by Maurice Kaver in 1854. And then we come to the 19th century. And uh, there is uh, one uh, work that got fame in 1949 that was written by Wellick and Warren, uh, published, uh, they published their theory of literature in which they echoed with Coite's uh, statement, if you remember that we discussed in our first uh, video, and what they say, literature is one, as art and humanity are one. So they are of the view that the whole literature of the world is actually one body of literature, and we cannot bifurcate one literature from other. The role of comparatives, and what they say, that the role of comparatives are highly valued as someone with a vocation as a kind of international ambassador working the comparative literatures of the United Nations. What they say, whoever compares literature, he does not only do some kind of literary work, but he also performs a vocation a role of an ambassador who brings the message from one nation to other, who carries the message from one nation to other, and this is how he becomes our age, an agent of harmony and uh, mutual coordination. But unfortunately, these high ideals of such vision of comparative literature have not been met. Only a decade after theory of literature appeared valid uh, was already uh, talking about crisis in comparative literature. Only after a decade, Wellick was this much disappointed that he talked 
uh, started talking about the crisis of comparative literature. It means that uh, right after the rise of comparative literature in English world, uh, it get it got its fall on as well. Then there came literary thoughts, literary theories, and uh, all the people, all the researchers turned towards the literary theories and literary thoughts. And these were common sense to reader response theory, structuralism to post structuralism, colonial to post colonial, new stories, uh, historicism to cultural materialism, semiology to psychoanalysis, formalism to new uh, All the researchers of time turned their head towards the literary thought and in their researches in understanding the literature, the pieces of literature uh, with the view of the reader, they stopped comparison of literary text with each other, uh, shifted attention away uh, from the activity of comparing text and tracking pattern of influence between writers toward the role of the reader what we just discussed that uh, the attention was shifted from comparing the text to the role of the reader the role of the reader was more important than the text and the, even than the writer and as each new wave broke over the preceding one notion of single harmonious readings was shattered forever you see that one after one literary theories and literary thought come came and uh, one thought replaced the other thought. And it also happened that various literary theories go simultaneously and they overlapped each other and also they went simultaneously side by side. So it was uh, completely out of order and there was no harmony among these uh, thoughts. And that sh shattered the string of the literary analysis in that uh, way that it, wa it was uh, used to be done in the time of com rise of comparative literature. In the 1950s and early 1960s, high-flying graduate students in the West turned to comparative literature as a radical subject. Again, we see that uh, what, what uh, Sosan Bassman says, that uh, in the decade of 50s and 60s, the higher researcher turned towards comparative literature because at that time it appeared to be uh, transgressive, moving across the boundaries of single literature study. But what happened next? By the late 1970s, a new generation of high flying graduate students in the West turned to literary theory, as we discussed earlier. And most of the people turned towards literary theory. Women's studies, semiotics, film and media studies, and culture studies as the radical subject choices abandoning comparative literature to what were increasingly seen as dinosaurs from a liberal humanist prehistory. So most of the people turned towards literary theory and they left comparative literature behind. But at the same time, this discipline appeared in the third world, in Asian countries like China, third world at that time. In Taiwan, Japan and other Asian countries and what they did their work was actually about the specificity of the national literatures they compared the national literatures of this country and the literature that was particularly associated to uh, some particular nation so they started that kind of comparison but it was definitely uh, shape of comparative literature. So that is all for today. This is the brief history that we discussed and uh, I hope that it will be sufficient and uh, there will be other aspects of history and we will keep on discussing these aspects uh, along with our other topics regarding our comparative literature. So see you soon in the next video. Inshallah. Thank you very much. God bless you.